Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for June the 26th, 2020. This is episode number 12. Today, we'll be talking about the debut of the Lordstown Endurance pickup. Uh, Nissan Area reveal date has been announced, and Tesla ranks last in the JD Power initial quality survey. I'm Dominic Ioni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. And he also puts together the super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that notifications bell. So welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. Uh, lots to talk about today. But before we get to the big news, uh, let's see, what do we have charging up in our driveways this week? You have something there, Kyle? Uh, unfortunately, nothing electric this week. It's the Kia Seltos. Uh, but I did do some EV stuff this week, even though we're really, you know, we have this spike in North Carolina, so we're just staying home. Uh, but I took the electric smart car our out of spec camera car on a 70 mile per hour highway range test, which did not that take very funny. long. Right. <laughs> and uh, we achieved 51 miles of range. So that was my excitement really? for the day yesterday. Uh, that, that's pretty good actually. Cause the EP range on that is what 57 miles, 57 miles for the Cabrio, which mine is. And, um, yeah, it's not uh, too big of a disparity. I did 44 miles on the highway. I pulled off at 6% and then just kind of drove around at 50 mile an hour side roads, which is how I always finish off the test, just to drain the packs all the way down. Um, but it just didn't shut off. I mean, even after the pack hit 0%, the thing just kept running and running. I got, honestly, uh, it shuts the air conditioning off at 10% state of charge. And I just stopped right. when I got too hot. <laughs> I mean, I, it probably would have gone another mile or two. Right, and that's a fun video too. That you can see, you can find that on Inside EVs uh, this morning. Um, so, Tom, do you have something this week? Sure. Yeah. So, actually, I just um, the I had the Hyundai Kona EV and the Hyundai Ionic electric, and they just picked up the Ionic. Um, so, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the Kona in last week's podcast. I was able to drive uh, 200 and I finished up with 245 miles at 1% state of charge on our 70 mile an hour highway range test. So I like to tack on a couple miles because I couldn't drain it down to zero. And we, we finished up with 247 miles, which is really close to the 258 mile EPA range rating. Did a little bit better than Kyle did when he had the Kona, the Kona and did his range test, but it was also about 10 to 15 degrees warmer when I did the test. So you can expect 10 or 15 more miles if there's that much of a uh, of a, a difference in the ambient temperature. Uh, then uh, Hyundai was kind enough to drop me off a Ionic electric when they picked up the Kona. I wasn't planning on that. It was a kind of a last minute thing. They said, hey, we, we, got the, we just got the Ionic in. Uh, would you like to have one of those? And uh, of course, I was happy to take that vehicle and uh, it was brand new. It had, I don't know, 50 or 60 miles on it when they dropped it off. And uh, haven't done any post yet because I haven't pieced the videos together. But what I will say is for the first time ever, I was able to drive a car at 70 miles an hour and drive it further than the EPA range rating at a constant 70 miles an hour, which is ridiculous. Uh, Hyundai is great on efficiency like Tesla. Um, and it's amazing when you think about it because the Kona and the Ionic they're not dedicated platforms. Those cars are made, built to have, uh, you know, multiple platforms and uh, with ICE uh, involved. So it's really something that they're able to, to make these vehicles so efficient, even though they're not totally designed ground up to be fully electric vehicles. Um, the one negative that I will say now for 2020, uh, Hyundai increased the size of the battery for the Ionic. Uh, it now has a 38.3 kilowatt hour battery pack. I think their, their original one was 24. It was really small, had, had low range. So now it's EPA range rated at 170 miles um, with the 38.3 kilowatt hour battery pack, but they ruined it. They dropped the DC fast charge rate from 
uh, close to I think it was I think it was uh, close to seventy kilowatts, like that Kona on the previous version. It's now it's supposed to peak at four, f around forty kilowatts. I think there's some uh, video shown in Europe where it was charging at almost forty kilowatts. But here in the U.S., I don't know why. Perhaps there's something wrong with this car. I charged it on three DC fast chargers, two Electrify America, one EV Go. I wasn't able to get more than 22 kilowatts at any time. And I drained it down to zero, the battery, um, and was charging, you know, for the full range. So it took me almost two hours to get it to 80%. Uh, and that's at 150 kilowatt DC fast charger. It it, the charger itself shouldn't have been limiting the power. So, uh, you know, I, I've already reached out to Hyundai and to Electrify America in particular to ask them to take a look at what was going on and why it wouldn't charge faster than that. But an otherwise really nice EV that's not too expensive, incredibly efficient. I couldn't, I could never recommend this car to anyone that wasn't going to just use it for local driving after seeing how long it takes. I mean, it's 2020. And uh, for me to get the 22 kilowatts for the most on DC fast charge, it's just a brutally long wait. If, you, if, if, if you're taking this vehicle anywhere, it's hours of waiting, not minutes um, to have it recharged. So, um, Crazy that Hyundai did that. They, they, in my opinion, they like ruined the car. I loved it up until the point I charged it, and then I was like, ah, like I, this is, you know, I'm uh, incredible how long it took. But um, we're gonna have the full review up on the uh, Ionix range test and the charging test uh, this week on Inside EVs. Just uh, if I can quickly ask uh, Tom, what sort of temperatures are you there in New Jersey at the moment? So it was, when I did the charging test. It was right, I think it was 80 or 81 degrees. I had just driven it like 50 miles. So the combination, and I drove it hard because I was trying to drain the battery down to zero. So the combination of driving it hard and um, 80 degrees, the pack should have been nice and warm. So that it, it was not being restricted because it was too cool. Um, I, you know, I almost think it, I, I was pulling in at almost the ideal temperature to, to, to DC fast charge at. Yeah, it doesn't get any any better than than that. It's kind of uh, low twenties, I think, uh, in, in in Celsius. And of course, when you did your Kona test as well, it was a lot warmer than Kyle when you when you did yours, and 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 that extra range did come through. So temperature is a, a big thing to uh, to factor in if we're going to do these accurate range tests. Yeah, well, we can't control that. We can't always control when we get the cars. So the best we can do, um, at Martin, is is include that in our report, in our review. And it's another reason why Kyle and I like to try to both get cars. And um, what, what we'll do is when Kyle does a range test and I do a range test on the same car, we're going to average the two. And that's what we're going to put in our chart. We're, make, we're building a chart now that lists all the cars we've tested at 70 miles an hour. And, you know, we're just going to average them because, you know, people drive in cool weather and warm weather. And and as everybody knows, there's no one range on how far a car can go. Uh, you know, people say, oh, well, there was an elevation when you did that range test. Yeah, well, you drive on roads that have elevation changes, too. So, you know, in, unless you're out on a on a racetrack, you know, just driving in circles where it's perfectly flat. You know, what we do, I think, is 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 important to show that, hey, this is what people will see when they're driving out there in the wild. Yeah, I, I'm just disappointed that you ended up with the range test with 1% because, you know, Kyle, you know, you went down to zero in the Mini. Unless you're pushing a car to the charger, it's not a real range test. <laughs> oh, I, I think we do really well. If you look at some of the other range tests, Martin, from other websites, they stop at like 40% and then they calculate the difference. You know, at the most, when I do them, it's one or two percent. And, you know, Kyle has a, a little bit of an advantage. He can finish up at the racetrack and he can get off the highway and then just drive around the racetrack. When I do my range tests, I'm driving on the New Jersey Turnpike. I'm calculating the whole time. OK, I have 15 miles remaining. I have to figure out when I need to turn around so I can arrive at the charging station perfectly. And, and I've been getting really good at it. I've, I've done six or seven cars now, and I've always gotten within 2%. And, you know, I mean, sure, I can get off the highway and then drive at 30 miles an hour for a while, but then that's not a 70 mile an hour range test. I want to get off the highway and plug in. So it's I'm constantly adjusting where I'm going to turn around, how far I'm going to go, because 
you know, if, if, if I miss, if I miscalculate, I'm calling a tow truck, you know, I'm not, you know, um, you know, Kyle can get a couple friends to push him to the building at the racetrack. So. And that's a challenging doing these 70 mile an hour range test. Kyle, or Kyle was saying to me yesterday, maybe he might be down in my neighborhood uh, in the future and we might do a, a range test on my 2015 Sparky V. And so I was just thinking about the logistics of that, man. So yeah, you have to ca calculate exactly how far you go out because we don't have a lot of charging stations here. Yeah. We but have you one have one at your speed. house, right? Well, that's actually low speed. I just use my 110, you know. Well, it'll low. be sitting on that 110 for a little while when we get yeah, back. Right. <laughs> but we have a, we do have an, an Electrify America. Um, but it actually, my car wasn't compatible with the first time I tried it, but I learned a little trick and I, I needed to try it out and see if I can get actually get my car to charge there. And then we'll, I, I will use that. I've heard a lot of problems with Sparks and Electrify America. Uh, yeah. Tom, do you know what the status is on this? You know, the thing is, you know, the Electrify America and the other charging networks, they need cooperation from the manufacturers, you know, when they're, when there's a problem. And, you know, one of the things that people seem to not understand or not really care about, and I understand when you pull up to a charging station, you don't care. You just want to plug in. You want the damn thing to work. Like, I don't care what you have to do. Just make it work. But you know, one of the advantages Tesla has is they're so vertically integrated and they do everything. They build the cars, they design the charging logic, they design the charging stations, they build the charging stations. It, 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 it's impossible for it not to work. But when you deal with public charging networks like Electrify America, or ChargePoint, now you've got dozens of manufacturers that have different EVs and they all have different communication protocols. It's not like, well, people say, oh, just follow the CCS protocol. Different magic manufacturers interpret it differently. They're slightly different handshakes, and it just takes this tiny little glitch for it not to work. Now, take the Spark, for instance. It's a car that's no longer made by GM. So, you know, GM doesn't necessarily want to throw a lot of time and effort and money having their engineers, you know, work with uh, a charging network, per se, if if there's some sort of a communication problem, the charging network can't do it on their alone. They need to work with the engineers from the company. They need to send them the data, say it keeps dropping when this occurs, when it hits this temperature or whatever, you know, you, can you change this or can you tell us what we need to change on our end to make it work? And I think that's what's going on with the spark it was a low production compliance car and I don't believe GM wants to spend any effort in making it. Now, I don't have any proof of that, um, but I know Electrify America has said, we want every EV to work. We're willing to do whatever we can on our side to make every electric vehicle connection work because, hey, that's why we're here. We're here to sell electricity. We don't want to exclude any electric vehicles. Um, but if they don't get that reciprocated from the manufacturer, they, th there's, there's only so much they can do. Yeah, and we, we've seen that over here in Europe, even on a brand new car. So this isn't a legacy problem. This is I've seen this on the um, the, the PSA group cars that are on the CMP platform. So Peugeot E208, Vauxhall Corsa E, the DS3 Crossback E tents, and and those these YouTube videos of the first cars being handed over now, plugging into the high powered chargers. Yep over here, uh, they're just not doing the handshake and people are having to pop the bonnet and disconnect the 12 volt battery to reset the car and give it a go again. So it's not as if these are kind of, it's all, oh, you know, the spark is a legacy car, let it die. And uh, it happens even with new cars as well. But the difference, Martin, is with the new cars, the manufacturer will then work with Ionity or whoever it is to get it fixed. Because it's embarrassing. This car yeah, it's it's, it's it embarrassing to not to work. If, if, it's, yeah. if it's a car that you haven't sold in three years and you only sold a few thousand of them, it's easy to say, you know what? Nah, uh, we're not, we're not going to assign a team of engineers to try to figure this out. You know, uh, so I think that's what's happening more than anything with right. the Spark. So one one real quick thing before we move on, you were talking about having the Kona earlier and uh, you did a range test, but you also did a charging test from like zero, like zero to 80%. Mm -hmm. And that was just an interesting finding because they, they say that it will charge uh, to 80% in what, 54 minutes? Yeah. So Hyundai claims on a 100 kilowatt DC fast charger that it will charge at zero to, zero to 80% in 54 minutes. 
and I was able to confirm that they are correct. I actually did it in a touch over 52 minutes, so it was slightly quicker. And uh, for that range, for that charging test, yes, I did drive it down to zero. I actually almost didn't make it to the charger because Hyundai's and Kyle could probably attest to this. They didn't. They don't have that much of a buffer in there after you hit zero. And when I hit zero, I was still almost two miles from the Electrify America site where I was going to charge in, and I was on the highway, and the car just started slowing down, and I was like. I was ready to drive in the shoulder. I was going like 30 miles an hour on a 55 mile an hour speed limit, but I was able to get in and plug in and yeah, it charged from zero to 80% in like 52 minutes. Nice. All right. So I guess we should move on to the stories of the day. Uh, before we get to our big story, something came in this morning and I thought we should just throw out there. The first uh, Polestar 2 customer cars are arriving in Europe. And we had said, uh, I think last week or the week before, that deliveries are expected to happen in the summer. They've always been saying the summer, but maybe it was going to be pushed back closer to the end of the summer. But now the first ones have arrived from China and they should be delivered in Norway and Sweden within a few weeks. So that's pretty exciting. And we haven't seen any um, media drives of this, but I'm informed that they will be happening. I didn't get an exact date, but there are schedules or something coming up. So we, we should be able to get a, a better idea of how, how this car is to drive. So, and that's pretty exciting. Is it not? Ryan, are you excited about the Polestar? Too? <laughs> are, you, are you excited about the Polestar too? Right, I, I think the Polestar is going to be an awesome machine. Uh, you guys know I'm totally about it. Uh, yeah. I really, really, really want one. I just wish that there was room in the back for the dogs. We spoke about this last show. Um, but yeah, this this type of shipping, uh, Martin and I were discussing pre-show, this roll-on, roll-off is uh, uh, very common for, for everyone to ship their cars around the world. And uh, it's great to see so many of them. It's also great to see the level of care that they're taking by putting them in these like bags. Uh, Audi does this with their vehicles. Uh, for example, BMW Mini don't really do this with their cars. So they're taking some extra precautions for at least these first ones. So we, they must recycle these bags, right? Uh, yeah, as sure. far as I'm aware, they do not, at least here in the US. Uh, I've seen a lot of dealers, you know, they arrive here and the okay. dealers just throw them all out. I mean, again, some brands may have different things, but at the right. end of the day, I think it's probably too complicated to ask the dealers to send these back to wherever the cars are going originally. And I'm pretty sure they just get junked. Right. Is that is that plastic or like a light cloth? Or? It is a light cloth. Okay. Interesting. Hmm. All right. So let's move on to our big headline of, this, of the day is uh, Lord's Town Motors uh, has revealed officially their endurance electric pickup truck and so they're affiliated with the workhorse group and we were hearing a bit about the workhorse group uh, last few years i think they have a uh, a vehicle in the united states postal service uh competition um but anyway this is split off from them and they've bought a gm plant in lordstown ohio and they're building this pickup truck if you're watching on youtube you can see the picture up there now and uh Let's see, so yeah, this presentation was not your usual run of the mill auto reveal. It was a bit, um, how shall we say, bizarre. You can see the full video of that on uh, Inside EVs. Uh, for starters, uh, things kicked off with the president of Youngstown State University, Jim Trussell, uh, coming out on the stage and uh, you know kicking things off and introducing the a couple guests. And he was followed by uh, Aaron Spring of Goodyear Tire which I guess is a partner supplier. And I guess I, they had a, the Goodyear blimp, blimp was flying overhead at, at the same time. And then the CEO, Steve Burns, came out and talked about the company and uh, what they're attempting to do with the factory and the truck. And he got into some details about the truck, you know, but the hub motors uh, are the big innovation, he says, because they're, they're in-wheel motors. They're made by a, a company called, uh, let's see if I got this pronunciation right, Ilafe which is also the name of a, a genus of snake, if that means that's not really important, but uh, I just thought it was kind of funny. But if you look at the picture, the in-wheel in motors actually, to me, are like the highlight of the design of this truck. It looks a lot, you know, it looks basically exactly like the concept that we saw. 
but uh, you know, more, I guess more real and, and those wheels look sharp, but just to get back real quick to the uh, presentation. Um, yeah, because of this approach, this drivetrain, he says only has four moving parts, the wheels, um, and yeah, right. And that comes from Milafe and those, those in wheel motors will be made in the factory as well. And he says, uh, you know, it's going to be a very capable, it should have some of the best, you know, uh, tractive capabilities of electric trucks because of the, the, the way they can individually, uh, meet out the power to each wheel. And he just also says it handles like a sports car. So that should be interesting to see. Uh, so then the presentation moved on and he introduced the secretary of energy, uh, Dan Brulier, and his remarks were interesting in that he spoke a lot about energy storage of batteries and trying to mine minerals and rare earth minerals uh, in the United States right now. I guess um, at least 80% of those uh, uh, materials come from China, I think, for the most part. They've, they really cornered the market for uh, historical reasons going back 30, 40 years. Um, so that's kind of interesting, except he, he did mention that the DOE is researching how to identify and extract critical minerals and rare earth elements from UMTAP sources, such as our vast coal reserves, which is, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that we have a lot of rare earth minerals available in, in coal, but, you know, that's straight from the uh, mouth of the head of the Department of uh, Secretary of Energy. So uh, after that, after he left the stage, we got a little video presentation and the truck truck drives up on the stage and who gets out of the passenger seat, but vice president, Mike Pence. And he goes to the podium and talks about the truck for a bit before talking about other things surrounding that like trade deal legislation and then moving on to coronavirus. I mean, it had a lot of um, uh, the vibe of a campaign stop really. So that was kind of interesting, but we did find out during all this that they do have like uh, 14,000 pre-orders, I think. And they, they're targeting 20,000, I think, for 2021. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty interesting. And th th this is supposed to be coming out the uh, first uh, in January of 2021. So this could be very well be the very first electric pickup truck to make it to the market. So Tom, you have some thoughts about this? What are the podcast rules? Can I say no comment? <laughs> sure, you can say whatever you like. With you know, that's safe for work. Uh, I, I'll I'll make a comment. Dog and pony show. All right, that's my comment. I really don't have much more to say. I, it was almost embarrassing, in my opinion. And uh, um, you know, there's no way, no way that that vehicle is being delivered to customers in January. So, you know, I don't really. I'm handing it off to you guys. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I read a, I, I, I oh, read a thing recently about how few people are working for the company at the moment, and uh, and I right. thought they'd missed a zero off of that title, and I had to go back and and just check. And I've made a mistake here, and you know, read, read it a few times. And actually, no, there, there are that that few people working uh, for the company, and some of those were even in R and D, not even working on building um, the thing. I mean, goodness, they they need to scale that up. It look, it's hard for any any company. When uh, we had the news this week that Cybertruck, uh, well, we had the uh, the comment this week from an analyst that Cybertruck was at 650,000 um, pre-orders and so it's 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 hard for anyone to kind of get a look in especially when you come out with 14,000 non-binding uh, pre-orders or even expressions of interest with uh, with this uh, this thing it looks very very conventional and uh, it's got some interest the only interesting thing is about the hub motors but uh, as and as and when they make it and you get it uh, it's all up in the air isn't it Kyle you have some thoughts about this I have a few thoughts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, first off, why do you need hub motors? Why? Why? I guess they're re-engineering this. They're going with a whole new design. This motor thing, it's great. They can be built there. But what's wrong with just putting motors on axles and getting cars out? I just think this might be you have you know twice as many motors you need to tune, and maybe it maybe it's just me, but it seems overly complicated for relatively poor specifications. Now. I don't know. I'm not a company analyst. I don't know how many people are working there. I don't know if they'll be able to make it or not. Um, that's not for me to, to figure out. You know, that's Martin and Tom have that side of things way more covered from an industry analyst perspective. From a vehicle perspective, which I like to analyze vehicles, 
Uh, nothing, not a single thing about this car is wowing me at the moment. Uh, I, I know it's going to be a mainly a fleet vehicle. I think it's going to be uh, used in, in uh, delivery scenarios. I don't even know who would buy this thing, but um, it's not really that good looking. I hate to be so negative on it because I don't want to discourage new manufacturers from coming into the electric world. Um, I'm going to reserve a lot of judgment for when I get to drive it, but nothing's really that exciting. 200 miles of range, zero 60 in the five second range. Like I know that's not a key metric for trucks. It just, you know, if you're putting hub motors and really cool tech, you think you'd get some benefits into the numbers. But again, you don't drive cars on paper. You drive them on the road. So maybe this will have some secret magic inside. Oh, and, and I, I, let me I, let me and, qualify. And, let me just um, straighten out one thing about what I said earlier. I, I'm not trying to really talk down Lord Santa. I mean, I I, I hope they 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 succeed. Um, more the merrier. Uh, I'm specifically referring to that press conference. It was embarrassing. It yeah. was a political campaign stop. You yeah, know, you couldn't. Yeah, you, know, the, you couldn't I, hear it. The sound was all over the place. The camera I'm, work was terrible. Sure. It was a campaign rally. And why would you do something like that? Like, unless you have nothing to talk about with the vehicle, like what did we learn like about the vehicle? It was almost as if they had to fill the, the press conference with all this, um, you know, political stuff because they weren't ready to really talk about the bones of the vehicle. This is why you want this truck. It does this, it does that. It was just kind of like, you know, America and manufacturing and yay, you know, <laughs> and no substance. So it has nothing to do with the truck. It was completely, no. uh, it, I just was really, I honestly didn't even watch it. As, as soon as I saw, like, I skimmed through, I'm like, we're not seeing it off roading. We're not seeing anything cool. No. In I had to ask because I, I assumed at some point it was going to get better. <laughs> <laughs> but have you guys, did you guys see the F 150 reveal by any chance? In contrast, very much heavy focused on uh, uh, the truck itself. Also, kind of a weird day for them to choose to unveil it on the same day as the new F-150. So maybe they purposefully right. wanted to hide some of, the, <laughs> some of their stuff. I don't know, but it se seemed very odd. Yeah, the, well, I was the kind of hoping number, to get the, the only number that they, they announced that, that we hadn't heard was that there'll be 30 of them made by the end of the year. And that, that was new information, as far as I know. Okay, I miss. I even missed that part. I was looking for something about range or size of the battery, or you know, we still have the same numbers we have before. I don't know if they talked about the price at all, which is we have is fifty two thousand five hundred dollars, or forty five thousand after the uh, federal tax credit, and the range estimates are between two hundred and two hundred and fifty miles, which you know that's kind of pretty loosey goosey kind of numbers and approximately maybe a 70 kilowatt hour battery, who knows, zero to 65.5 seconds. Yeah. And deliveries first of January, which would make it, if, if they, ha they have to finish build, rebuilding the factory and setting it up and get production underway. I just think Rivian is kind of going to beat them to it. You know, I think uh, Rivian was going to, I think, uh, maybe start delivering late this year, but they had to push it back a bit. But they're, you know, you have some footage. They're out in the uh, desert testing. They're, they're, you know, taking their trucks. They've driven them from South America all the way up to North America, some mules, and tore those down and learned from those and, you know, re-engineered some things. But the, And, you know, now they're just, like, taking it out the desert for the weekend. And, you know, you can see in the video here, you're getting a little sideways and, and crawling over some, like, crazy sandy terrain, rocky terrain, up crazy hills. You know, there's a lot to get excited about. I mean, this is like a thousand times more exciting than that presentation yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's cool. There's, there's some shots of the uh, of the Rivian yeah. uh, taken off in, uh, in dirt, in soft soil. Uh, and it's interesting that all four wheels spin at once. And then uh, I was kind of nerdy enough to see which ones. And then the front wheels carry on spinning. So it's kind of interesting to see where they're diverting of the power and, and, and the intelligent four wheel drive system uh, of where it gets. It needs to get the grip. And uh, and it's great that they've just put a video out. Of course, it's a 
you know, it's very carefully edited and it shows it in its its best light, of course, as you sure. would. And, uh, you know, this wasn't sort of something that we were sort of spying on or dropping into. Uh, but it's good. They show it off-road. They show it on tarmac, on, on asphalt as well. And it just, it, you know, it made me more excited for, uh, for the Rivian, which is something that I know that, I'm a little more detached over here than you guys. You've seen it, or you've had, it, you know, you've been up close, um, and you are more excited than uh, than I've kind of necessarily been able to get about it because, from my perspective, there's just a huge amount of hype around the company, a big investment from the likes of Ford and Amazon. So clearly, it's not vaporware, and and clearly, it's exciting. But there's there's not been anything as tangible as you've had to get excited about. So when I see a video like this, it's something that you can kind of grab hold of and think wow it looks it does look cool. again it looks very conventional it, from some angles and then i think from the front it looks a little more distinctive and it's just exciting to see something like this distinctive that's that's nice <laughs> so the uh i would say polarizing when i talk about the front of the Irvian. Uh, uh, I, 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 I think most people love it you really you think it's polarizing I well, I, I know the initial impressions were there was a lot of uh, comments about the, the lights in the front, the way they're you know they're because they're, it's not traditional like round or square. They're like kind of oblong, you know. They're so cool. Yeah. I just say I I haven't spoken to anyone that hasn't absolutely loved the design. So that's uh, interesting. But how sick is this footage? Rivian is capturing the emotional play here, right? They're right. saying here's what you can do with our trucks not here's what our trucks can do. Yeah, and yeah. so it, that's what I love. Also, right here, he drifts it a little bit, and it's just right. so, look at that! So cool. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> they've had the I drone, they've had the wait. drone out, and the drone is flying at like 50 miles an hour, and it just looks, it just looks cool. <laughs> it just <laughs> makes me want to go out there and rip on one of these things. I, I yeah. have to own one. I, every time I see one, I'm just like, this is the car for me. I know this is. They have a little bit of a different target audience than um, than Lordstown does, but I really do think that you know Lordstown could you know take check out these videos and uh, maybe take some notes. Yeah, I mean they don't have to show it. Their truck doing you know crawling up mountains, but like it's cool. it's aimed at the commercial market. So let's see it doing some commercial things. You know, hauling, which is yeah. I'm yeah. still I'm still stuck thinking about it. it's a commercial truck, but it's got four doors, and so that you know limits the size of the bed. I would rather see like, you know, like a king cab with a long bed in, in the back for a commercial truck. But that's just my thought. That'll come. That'll probably come, won't it? Maybe some different variations down the line, like a single cab and all those kind of things. Ah, it's right. difficult well, to say how Lord, many. For Lordstown, at least. I mean, I don't know. Oh, okay, for gonna... Lordstown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. And I understand yeah. where Dominic's coming with that because Lordstown is targeting commercial use. Uh, right. You know, unlike Rivian and and most of the other trucks we've seen, you know, like Rivian's an adventure vehicle. They're really, really pinning this as something where you take the family and you go on an adventure. Um, whereas the Lordstown is is really aimed at at commercial use, where you would think the bigger bed and not necessarily the rear seating wasn't wasn't uh, as important. So it's it's just more puzzling to where that where that vehicle is going to fit in, what it's going to do, and um, how they're going to go about bringing it to market. Right. I suspect they may they may need to raise some more money first to or get some more you know, partnerships or something going on too. So it's going to be a challenge. There's no doubt about no doubt about that. So let's move on from pickup trucks to crossovers. And this is like a, it's like a little under under the, um, under the uh, radar a bit, but the Nissan Aria is going to be unveiled on the 15th of July. It was just announced. And this is one of the, the vehicles that I, I'm personally pretty excited about because yeah, it's uh, uh, Nissan is one of the first companies to come out with a with an all electric vehicle, the the Nissan Leaf, of course, and that has you know aged not really, uh, not well, let's say, just because, and not so much aesthetically, just because of the uh, whole battery cooling situation, and it's mm. just it's just 
been hard it's a hard row the hoe for the uh, nissan leaf because they had you know a lot of early degradation and early batteries and that's uh, sort of haunted them i think over over time and they haven't really so i mean internationally they sold you know good numbers but like domestically they, they they're not even competing with the chevy bolt which you know hasn't also lived up to its initial sales uh, expectations but the, the the nissan aria uh it debuted in last uh last fall in Tokyo and I was lucky enough to, to see it there and man it looks you know super nice it's for uh, all-wheel drive it's got a, a liquid cooled battery um, it's got the actually I was in uh, Las Vegas for the CES thing and I got to drive a Nissan Leaf with sort of the what they call the uh, e-force drivetrain underneath it which kind of I think is going to be going up inside the the area and you could you know, we, we went out on some crazy, on a big, you know, there was a big stretch of parking lot with cone set up. And so we were doing like a big circle and acceleration test and uh, slalom. It, it was, it was great. And you could see on the screen, they had a little test screen. You could see which wheels are getting traction and how the, uh, how the brains of the car were really kind of, you know, helping you handle it through all the turns and it, it was it was something so it'll be really great to see how that all works out when it's all integrated in, into this crossover and they they also gave us a little teaser i'm not sure if you have any, that teaser for us there but uh, do you have thoughts on on this martin um yeah and i'm glad that they are doing something i've been a little bit increasingly worried about nissan and the leaf they had uh we talked about this on a, a few shows ago they did it was something like the A to Z of Nissan or something. There was a, you know, like a, a really quick slideshow video or something they put out. And and under L, there was no Leaf. And, and it just didn't it didn't feature Leaf. It was like the roadmap of Nissan and where it's going. And the Leaf wasn't on it. And I want the car to carry on and have a, a successful remainder of its life. It's made here in the UK, one of three places they make the Leaf around the world. And it just seems to be forgotten about the... You know the, the the friends that I have that own them. When they open up the app, I hear more stories about the app not working. The servers are down again, and they you know they want to preheat or cool the car, and it's it's winter. They want to get the ice off the screen, and once again, everyone starts using it, and the app goes down. And you think you know this isn't the behaviour. If that happened with Tesla, there'd be <laughs> outrage, and and you know there'd be somebody from the company fixing it, or there'd probably be. You know, uh, so somebody at the top of the company who likes to use Twitter talking about it. And it just seemed to be unloved. And so I'm just pleased that they're doing something in the full electric arena. Of course, Nissan do really good business with their e-power technology, which is basically a, a combustion car. It just uses an engine as a generator and it, uh, electric motors drive the wheels. So they, they do really well with that. And I worried a, a bit like Toyota have the success of hybrids. Actually, are they just going to stick to doing what they do really well? Um, and I, I hope they do bring more great full electric cars uh, this would be a really good start as well and as you you know we can see it's a very it's going to be a popular shape it's going to be a popular size and uh, and i hope that they they fully get behind it and it's not a of course not a compliance car but just not paying lip service to making an ev i mean yeah nissan is in a, in a bit of a spot it really needs this i think it really i think it really needs this car to take off and, and do super well it's got to be man They've. Well, if you look at Nissan's uh, newest problems over in Europe with the emissions cheating device on gas or petrol powered cars now, uh, mm -hmm. there's a whole new lawsuit against them and Renault, so a PSA stuff. And so the, I think they really need to focus on good EVs. And this has mm. the potential to be a really good EV. As Martin said, just put a little effort into it and some marketing behind it and some support after someone buys it. That would be really nice. So it, it supposedly has a range of maybe about 300 miles, we think. But Tom, um, Chademo, it's it's DC fast charging is going to be Chademo instead of CCS. Are you disappointed? Yeah, you know, I mean, Nissan is 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 uh, holding on to uh, Chademo. You know, I think that a lot of people were hoping that with the next generation Nissan that they would switch over to CCS just to simplify um, you know, the, the standards, uh, especially here in the U S it, it just seems like, you know, we, we, we can't seem to get one standard. Uh, Europe seems to have CCS ironed out a little bit better. Um, and I'm not even, I'm, I'm not here to argue to say which one's better, honestly, it's just, 
you know, it, it adds cost. All the charging stations have to have two connectors. Uh, you know, at, at some point, I'd like to see the public charging stations add a Tesla connector. But now you've now you've got three. You know, if 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 Nissan would would uh, you know have gone to CCS in the U.S., then maybe we could focus on getting uh, agreements with these networks. Um, to allow them to have a Tesla connector, like EVgo just got permission from Tesla. They must have struck some kind of a deal. I think EVgo was feeling the pressure of the Electrify America, and they that, so that kind of put them in a position where they had to strike a deal with Tesla to be able to use their connectors and charge their cars. Um, but if 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 we only had to deal with CCS and 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 uh, and Tesla uh, connectors in the U.S., that would simplify things. And I I think what you'd see would be agreements with charge point and electrify america and you know green lots and and everyone to have um the those two connectors so uh, you know i'm not surprised uh that nissan is sticking with it they they you know every time i've talked to them it seems like that's their the, you know that's their plan and that's what they're going with um so you know but as far as the the area you know i'm, I'm excited i just had the leaf uh plus on loan a few weeks back, we talked about it. Nice vehicle, did everything fine. Very competent electric car, but there's no, nothing that was like, oh, wow, this is great. It, even though it's a second generation, it felt tired. And, um, you know, I wasn't surprised when we saw that product planning and there was no vehicle, as Martin said, with, that began with an L. Uh, you know, the, the, this, the Aria has a chance to maybe pick up on the things that the Leaf didn't do well. It's got to have thermal management. It should have higher DC fast charging, longer range. Uh, it's in a great package. Again, as Martin pointed out earlier, this is the package, this small crossover that people are buying today. Uh, so, you know, it has the opportunity to be, you know, Leaf 2.0, even though it's not called Leaf. And, uh, you know, but the battery degrade degradation issues, well, let's just hope Nissan have, has that solved and has good thermal management because, you know, I was looking up some used Leafs just the other day, a friend of mine is interested in buying an electric vehicle as just a local runaround, uh, you know, and doesn't really have to go far. And so, some of the 2012 and 2013 uh, Leafs that are used, available to you, can buy them for like $3,000, $3,500. You can see half the bars are gone. And, you know, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the dealer's credit, the used car dealer lots, it was saying, you know, fully charged shows 40 miles. So, right. you know, you know, Kyle's smart car will run circles around it, you know, and, and you just can't have that, you know, that the, you know, an EV can't lose 50% of its range in eight years. You know, if, if that happens, the whole industry is going to crater, you know, Nissan right. didn't do electric vehicles a service by bringing out the leaf early. We thought they did early on that. Wow. You know, here's the first manufacturer fully behind electric cars. But now you've got these cars floating out there that that can't go half as far as they could when they were new. And it gives people a bad taste in their mouth. There are, you know, the people that aren't really EV aficionados look at this and say, geez, do I want to buy that, you know, fifty five thousand right. dollar Mustang Mach-E if, you know, it will barely go one hundred and fifty miles in five or six years? You know, so which isn't the case. But, you know, the, the general public doesn't really understand thermal management and why the leaf failed in that regards so really quickly um so the chatamo what what the the, the uh, electrify america stations all have those pretty much i think uh, what's the power output of those so so the not all electrify america station every site has one chatamo connector and right. it's limited at uh, 50 kilowatts and to okay. be honest with you you know electrify america it's really the step, the unwanted stepchild, um, you know, without coming out and telling you that, like you'd never get Electrify America to say that, but you know, they, they certainly don't want to be bothered with, 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 with Chatamo. Uh, right. You can tell that just by just putting one in every station. And if you, you see, you know, a lot of people give Electrify America a hard time about the stations not working, which is well-deserved. They're getting better, but they still have issues. The Chatamo ports have way more issues than than the CCS ports. And since you only have one at every location, if that thing doesn't work, you know you're 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 calling the tow truck. And uh, right. you know, it, it, in many instances, that's the case. Unfortunately. I'm going to chime in here for a half a second because this is an important topic that we really need to talk about just briefly. Uh, Chatamo in general 
needs to go away. I think personally, I think this new 3.0 standard is pretty cool. You know, it can do X number of charging power. It looks really nice. I like that, but we already have CCS. It fits our needs. Everyone's already using it. We're going to stick with it. And we're seeing everyone go that direction to Tom's point. Electrify America only puts one Shadow at their station. It's limited to 125 amp at whatever pack voltage your car is at. So anywhere between 32 and 50 ish kilowatt depending on your your car. The problem, like Tom also said, is it doesn't always work. And we just ran into this issue. This is the reason I bring it up. Alyssa took my Model 3 to Charleston last week, which is a five-hour trip from here. There's no supercharger in Charleston. So I gave her the Chatamo adapter, and she went to an EV Go. She was driving by and you know said, yeah, I'll go get a Dunkin' Donuts or whatever was there and spend 30 minutes. Plugs it in, doesn't work. So I'm like, you know what? There's an Electrify America 15 minutes up the road. Why don't you go up there, plug the car in? Gets there, running very low on charge, mind you. Cannot get it to work. Electrify America can't communicate with the station. The station won't talk to them. And they're like, yeah, sorry. Look on plug share. We're like, okay, well, there's level twos around. So I knew she wouldn't die. But uh, thankfully they had one last EV go. She made it with just like one or 2% in the battery, plugged it in, fingers crossed, and it connected and worked. But again, that was a really slow one. So this whole bugginess with, with public charging stations, DC in general, is really what limits confidence on road trips for EV owners. And this is something that does not have a big focus on it, but needs to uh, station reliability, not just station installations. Right, for sure. Let, and, and that, let me ahead, follow sorry. one thing with Kyle's comments. So um, not only does m many of the Electrify America uh, Chatham ports have issues, but now you introduced an adapter. Now it's the, the right. Chatham connector, Kyle's uh, Tesla Chatamo adapter plugging into the Model 3. There are so many points for a problem. And, uh, and so, so, you know, you may, if, if you rolled up, if Alyssa rolled up in a leaf, she might have been able to plug in and it, and, and it, and it connected and communicated. Um, right. Not at this particular one, just because that unit was offline completely. But yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Because I know, I know that I've, I've actually talked to Electrify America about this. And, um, and, and, you know, and, you know, they basically have said, you know, as, as it, adding that extra level of possible problem will increase the chance of it not, it not working. They actually asked me if I had a uh, Chatamo adapter, uh, which I don't, I have, I haven't bought that. So, so, you know, to kind of say like, well, if you're passing by one of our stations, can you plug in for me and, and, and send us a report if it works or not? <laughs> Cause they know I visit a lot of the stations and uh, I said, well, if you get, if you give me a Chatamo adapter, I'll do that, but uh, I'm not going to go buy one so I can um, help test the stations. But th that does add that extra level of possible problems. Right. So before we move on, I just want to mention that the uh, Inside EVs forum now has an ARIA section, like a sub form. You can go to insideevsforum.com and scroll down to uh, Nissan. And then there's a little area for area and uh, area for area. And uh, yeah, go ahead and you can discuss that vehicle. And, and I have a, there's a few threads already talking about what we've learned about it so far. But yeah, if you got an interest, we, we'd love to... Uh, here and see you participate there as well. So uh, moving along, the Cadillac Lyric has been teased ahead of uh, its unveiling, and that has been scheduled for August 6. So this is the first of the new generation of electric GM vehicles uh, coming out. And it was originally supposed to be shown or uh, revealed in April, I believe, April 2nd or something. And so it's been pushed back because of the pandemic and all that. And I, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this, but if you've seen, yeah, they give us a little teaser image, the profile, and, and we've lightened that image up a little bit, actually, so you can get a bit more detail of what's going on. And uh, I've actually got the chance to see this in, in person already, but um, it looks great. And to get an idea of the front end, if you go back on this story on Inside EVs, you can see an, an older linked, uh, link to an older picture about the... Um, with another teaser image and it's pretty similar to that original that concept 
in that in that teaser image there you can see it right there yeah it looks it looks really nice and it's the uh, new flexible electric architecture that gm is rolling out with their altium batteries and it should be uh, it should be uh as much as 100 kilowatt hour batteries i'm not sure they haven't really released any numbers on that yet but i'm expecting it to have 100 kilowatt hour batteries i think it, i think it needs that if it's going to be a, a premium flagship product like that and needs a big battery lots of range 300 miles you know i think is just like the minimum kind of now any thoughts on this we can move right along At, the production is uh, set for the for fall of 2021 and yeah that's pretty exciting so also in the news this week, uh, we'll hit some Tesla stuff real quick. Um, if you're looking for a seven row uh, Model Y, or seven row, a uh, three row, seven seater Model, model, model Y, that's uh, coming out soon. Uh, Elon Musk tweeted about that recently, answering somebody, asked him a question about it on Twitter, of course. And so that's something to look forward to, but in less positive news, um, um, Tesla was finally included in the JD Power US initial quality study or survey. And that covers the first 90 days of ownership. And it didn't do so well. It ended up at the very bottom. Um, I don't know. Are any of you guys familiar with the JD Power initial quality surveys? Yeah. Tom, you want to take this one? Uh, you know, yeah. And, you know, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on this. It's no secret that Tesla <laughs> delivers vehicles that aren't necessarily in tip top condition. You know, there were three or four issues with my Model 3 when, when I got it, minor issues, but still you have to report issues when, when, when they come. Um, the, what I think is more important though is the owner satisfaction surveys and Tesla consistently rates up at the top of those lists. So, you know, the, the, the people that have had the cars for a while, they love they love their Teslas. The, is Tesla more is a Tesla vehicle more likely to show up at your driveway or when you pick it up with issues than the other legacy brands? Absolutely. I'm sorry if anybody wants to debate that. They're I, they're just wrong. The fact is, Teslas do have much higher initial quality issues than just about every other brand. But the owners are most owners are willing to put up with that because they love their vehicles because the vehicles offer so much. And then after they've had them for a while, they kind of forget about those initial quality issues and they love their car and they give it a super high rating as far as owner satisfaction. That's how I feel. And you were saying you had two or three issues. And so the average here was like two and a half issues per, per car or something like it averaged out to. Mm -hmm. So, and those issues, if you look at, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, a misaligned headlights. It's hard to, or a paint blemish, which, you know, does happen. But um, the, this, let's just quote what J.D. Power says about it. Uh, the iconic study redesigned this year measures components that fail and features that are difficult to use, hard to understand, or don't work the way owners want. Now, of course, Teslas are electric vehicles, so a lot of owners aren't at all familiar with what to do the what to do with them or how you know necessarily to charge them up so there could be a lot more issues than you might get if you just jump into a, a dodge which incidentally managed to rank first in this uh, quality survey initial quality yeah, survey they don't make any cars so if you don't <laughs> make any cars they can't break <laughs> right but actually also, can you pull that chart back up because all of the best car manufacturers rank the worst Right. So the good ones are all terrible quality. I guess my relation to loving vehicles equates to poor vehicle build quality because I love Land Rovers, Volvos, uh, you know, Mercs, Porsches down there, BMW somewhere in the middle. You know, <laughs> why are all the good ones at the bottom? Right. Well, if you go, so this is the initial initial quality study. If you look at the like three year um, JD Power again, the three year mm. the three year dependability survey. Uh, it's a whole different story in that situation. Like Genesis now, I believe is their top in their three-year dependability. Land Rover still on the very bottom, but 
Um, <laughs> Chrysler is like That's second surprising. last, and, and 31st. <laughs> Dodge is like 25th. Jeep is below it. And, and in, in the initial quality survey, Jeep ranked above Lexus. So, <laughs> and it's just so you, you have to take initial quality studies with a grain of salt. It, it's it's kind of bad news for Tesla in a way because it looks bad, but it's it's. It's not really a big deal. It's not going to stop anyone from buying one. Well, I hope it doesn't because it's, yeah, it's not an, really an important metric. Yeah. Their yeah. owner satisfaction is off the charts. So right. that's really what's more, much more important. But I mean, it, it is true. You know, there's some, it, they have to at some point get better with, 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 you know, building the cars and quality control. You know, a friend of mine got a model three and um, he when, when he opened up the trunk, the whole inside rear trunk assembly like was never like, attached. It was missing screws and everything. So like you could just lift up the whole thing and look underneath the trunk. And like, how does that not get checked? Right. You know, that should never happen. When I got yeah. my model three, this one of the things I had was the the speaker cover the that's in the um, A pillar by the driver had a huge slice in it. And it was cut like, I don't know. It looked like somebody took a razor blade and sliced it. Like how, I, I can't ever imagine uh, any OEM delivering a car like that. You know, I mean, it, you couldn't not see it. Anybody who sat in the car to drive it to the, the dealership or to, or to drive it out to where the customer is going to pick it up, you couldn't not see it. And I was just like, meh, like, you know, you see anything wrong? I'm like, yeah, how about that giant gash in the speaker thing there? All right, I'll write it down. We'll, we'll, we'll replace it. And right. they did, you know, about right. three and a half months later, um, which, uh, you know, I was okay with, uh, it, you know, it, but it just fits the mold of the initial quality is terrible. But three months later, I'm loving my car and I don't care that the speaker was sliced. So, you know. And in fairness, that could have happened during the delivery from the factory to the store from, you know, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, it is hard to understand though how some, some of the, I mean, we've seen a lot of uh, Tesla flaw stories and, you know, and I don't think it, they're necessarily worse than a, like a lot of other manufacturers, but you know, the electric world is like laser focused on, on Tesla and, and its quality. And so those are the stories that, you know, bubble up to the surface. There's plenty of great ownership stories out there, but those don't really make for compelling headlines, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So let's move along. <laughs> okay. So this is pretty cool. So the, um, Jaguar has revealed its improved 2021 I-Pace. It's got faster AC charging, uh, but no range increase, but it's got, a, and it's got a few other things. Can you tell us about that, Kyle? Right. Well, the only increase in AC charging is if you have three-phase compatibility, which in the uh, U.S. means nothing. Uh, so, But the I-Pace is a fantastic product as is. It's actually, uh, I think it's my favorite Jag, and... They're just so great, aren't they? I mean, you know, pe people don't realize how great they drive. They handle amazing. The biggest problem with the iPace up to this point has been the user interface, just interacting with it. Like, for example, whenever I get in one, my friend works for JLR, so I get in iPaces a lot, which I'm really lucky to. So I sit down and I want to turn the air-conditioned seat on, and this is a 45-second proposition because you hit the start button and you're just trying to turn it on. Finally, now, uh, with the launch of the new uh, Defender, which is an awesome vehicle, and we'll see plug-in versions down the road, Land Rover introduced their new UI system. I forget exactly what it's called, but it's awesome. I've played around with it. So they're putting this new snappy UI into the iPace with a little bit of a trip planner in there, and now we got ourselves a really enticing product. Um are you going to be buying one of these over one of the $20,000 discounted ones that are sitting on the lot? Absolutely not. But this is a, it's nice to see improvements coming down the uh, JLR lineup. And I will say this new UI that they've added is really good. There's some other touches like redesigned uh, accent bits and things like this, but overall the car is the same still only does hundred kilowatt charging, which I was disappointed with. This thing should do at least 150 kilowatt to match uh, e-tron on a DC fast charger. And um, yeah, but it's a great car. I, and, and this only makes it better. That's what 234 miles of range EPA range. 
that was the case, but then they sent a software update to the car that uh, this one had to be done at the dealer that unlocked more of the battery usability. So as they gathered data from cars in the fleets, they said, okay, we're actually, you know, people are not doing X, Y, Z, and you can open it up. They also opened up uh, over the year updates with this dot two version of the iPACE, the updated one. And now it can update modules such as your BMS and your drivetrain stuff. And so Jags really, uh, with the new versions, allowing more things to be updated over the air with regular updates. I believe the update that all current iPACE owners need to get is called H.264. And I think that update gives you that increased battery capacity. So uh, yeah, cool, cool stuff for sure. It's a great product. Not enough people buy it. No one ever looks at it, but it really deserves some thought, especially the secondhand market now where they're in the mid $40,000 range. Man, that's some depreciation. Do we have a picture of that, uh, Martin? I think the, the it looks a little different if you look at the uh, at the image on the man, they've I don't know if they've they've changed something with the grill a little bit. It's like different slightly different accents. I don't really notice anything visually. Just a little bit more of a bright pack. The grill looks the same to me. Okay. Uh, there's different versions of the grill you can get, whether you get driver assistance or not. So you could be seeing uh, that uh, differentiation there. Right. Uh, yeah. And there's a picture of the insides. It says, yeah, it's a really nice vehicle to sit in. And uh, yeah, it's nice. It has a 360 uh, view now on the screen or something as well. Right. Yeah, those things. You know, I, I spend a lot of time with these cars with 360 systems, and I've yet to find one that's been useful. Oh, really? uh, <laughs> yeah, I just think it's too disorientating, disorientating, right. disorienting for sure. my side. And um, yeah, the, the problem with the I-Pace, though, is it's like a great starter EV. Uh, but it's not really a road tripper and it's not really that good for the nerds because it doesn't give you any stats or statistics. Like it doesn't tell you ever how fast you're charging when you plug into a unit. You can't schedule charging and you cannot um, set your maximum charge limit. There, there's like uh, all of this data that I want and uh, right. it doesn't give you any of that. Also, <laughs> this is funny. A lot of European EVs have this thing because uh, in Europe they use Type 2, which doesn't have really a latch on it. But in the US, our J1772 connectors have a latch. So if the car is charging, the only way to pull the charge port out, even if the car is unlocked, is to physically take the key and click the unlock button on the key. And that unlocks the charger. And it's just super annoying. <laughs> One thing it does do that a lot of other EVs doesn't don't doesn't don't do don't do is that it goes off road well. It can forward up what three feet of water, I think. Right. Yeah. Every, races. <laughs> every JLR SUV is capped at that same three feet or whatever it is. But right. Three meter. I don't know. Three feet. Yeah. I mean, I would, but they can I would, do more. <laughs> I think it's the only only vehicle I would you know, electric vehicle that I would drive through deep water as, you know, so far as it's on the market until at least maybe Rivian will do better. I'm not sure, but yeah. Oh yeah. I'm sure Rivian will do better, but the I-Pace is great. You know, we've taken it over that Land Rover. Every dealer has their off-road display in the front of it, at least here right. in the U S and right. we've taken it over and put wheels in the air and it's, it's a solid built vehicle. I've also had it on the racetrack sideways drifting around. I mean, it is a really great car. And once these prices dip down into the $30,000 range, which they will soon, uh, that's going to be a really enticing proposition to maybe upgrade Alyssa's i3 into an iPACE or something like this because it's a lot more car and not that much more money. Well, I, I hope when the, the 2021s come out that we can get one to you there because it would be really great to see that on the track again and just help, help them get the word out. I'm not sure what kind of money they're putting into the marketing for the IPs, but... They have one in the media fleets across all of the U.S. and it's in yeah. L.A. So yeah, next time I'm in L.A., which I have to go anyway, I'm grabbing the IPACE and I'm taking it on a California road trip, which will be nice. I already have that worked out. Right. That, that kind of media effort, is just it's just not enough. You know, it's, like you said, it's your favorite Jaguar. It's, you know, in many respects, it's like the best Jaguar, I think. But I, you know, I'm probably well, it's biased. definitely the best electric Jag. To this oh, yeah. Point. We That's know that for sure. <laughs> That's right. So moving along. Um, so Electrify America has announced its first cross-country route. And the second is near completion. Tom, you saw this. Yeah, so um, you know this was uh, uh, kind of a long time coming. 
Uh, I think that, you know, they've been talking about connecting uh, the, the coasts for a while, Electrify America. And as you can see from their map, I mean, that's, you know, the good thing about Electrify America is they're not just going out and putting chargers wherever they can find a property that will allow them to. They're really planning routes to enable long distance travel. Now, as Kyle and I both know, the, uh, you know, the, the East Coast is already covered. You, you can drive, you know, anywhere you want on the East Coast. And Kyle and I have both done that. I mean, I drove the Mini Cooper SE from New Jersey to North Carolina and, you know, had a, you know, that wouldn't go more than 90 miles between um, charging stops. And I had no problem doing it. So now we can go, uh, the, the, the first route is from uh, Washington, D.C., to LA, that's complete. Uh, that's 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 open. And the southern route from Jacksonville, Florida, to San Diego is going to be ready in about two to three months. Uh, Electrify America said by September um, that'll be completed because it's mostly completed now. But there's a few sites that are under construction that haven't been completed and signed off on yet. So a couple of months and they'll be done. Uh, you know, uh, for all the issues that Electrify America stations have had and. We've gone through that. Yes, they, they, they're not perfect. There's still quality control issues. Um, you know, for all the problems, and look at what they've done. You know, they, they, they set their first site in uh, Massachusetts in June of 2018. So in two years, two years. Yeah. they have almost 2,000 charging stations in the ground. Um, uh, connect, you know, connectors. They have, I, as site-wise, I think it's uh, 450, somewhere around there. I don't know the exact number of sites, but almost 2,000 actual stations in two years. That that's an incredible pace. You know, to get to 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 435 or 450 sites in 25 months. It when Tesla started installing their superchargers back in, I think it was 2012. I think it took them four and a half years, almost five years to get to their 435th site. And it's taken Electrify America two, two years, basically. So about half the time to install that amount of sites. Now, yes, Electrify America has less stations per site. They average about four. And I think Tesla supercharger sites here in the U.S. average about six per site. So, you know, I'm not saying Electrify America is better than Tesla. The supercharger network is still the greatest electric car charging network in the world by a long margin, but we have to give Electrify America some credit here. They've installed these at an incredible pace and that they, they don't seem to have any sign of slowing down. Um, they still have some, some, some issues to work out with credit card readers, with, you know, with just, you know, overall um, uptime that has to be improved of the stations. But um, for what they've done, it needs to be commended, in my opinion. They've done a fantastic job. This is hard stuff. They put these charging stations in the ground that, at the time, nobody else was installing them. Now, when I talked to um, Giovanni um, Palazzo, the, the CEO of Electrify America, you know, he said, look, we weren't, um, uh, you know, bound to install high-speed charging stations. Um, uh, and the picture you see up there right now is actually the one uh, in the Electrify America's headquarters parking lot, Western Virginia. I took that picture. Um, they, they they could have installed 50 kilowatt DC fast chargers everywhere. And and that those products were already made. They're proven. They worked. They would have no problems like they're having now. But they elected to put in these ultra high speed charging stations, basically build something that didn't exist. And that's part of the reason why they're ha they're still having issues now. You know, I've been giving them a pass for a while now, but you know, it's it's time that you know, I, you know, I and everybody else maybe hold them to task a little bit more because okay, it's 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 been a couple of years now. You've done great installing these and opening up these corridors. Congratulations! Thank you for bringing this public charging to us. But they've got to work, and uh, you know, you've you've got to you've got to iron out these issues. Yeah, but it will be the like the most aside from Tesla. It, it will be the most viable, fast fast charging network out there in in North America, which is kind of crazy that you know we had to get use money from the diesel lawsuit settlement, you know, to do this and like no other 
providers of energy, you know, the traditional like gas stations, uh, energy companies, Shell, BP, Shell does have its green lots. It does a lot of stuff behind the scenes, but you know, th there could just as easily be, you know, a cross country network of Shell s mm. charging stations. Right. It's just so expensive. It's it, the, yeah. there's no profitable way to make money off DC charging right now. Well, not, I mean, not to begin. Cost eight, 900,000, a million dollars plus to put in. I mean, you got to sell so much electricity and right. then you get it with demand charges. So right. there's a lot of problems there, but how long do you think it is before someone, you know, tries to beat the cannonball on this route? <laughs> Man, right. Mm. Uh, because right. right now it's, you know, uh, only Tesla's have done record breaking cannonball electric vehicle trips. Cross country. So, you're talking not. Actual yeah, it has to be New York to LA and they right. have that route now. No problem. Right. You go down mm. you know, the traditional routes going through Oklahoma city down I 40, uh, for down yeah. through New York. It's eight, uh, uh, it's 2,850 miles. So how long do you think? Do you think we'll see an e-tron owner try and do it or a Tycon owner potentially? Well, yeah, maybe would be maybe interesting. Tycon, the 270 kilowatt charge speed. Maybe that gets a little upgrade at some point in the future they're talking about. What's what's really nice uh, to see actually is, is you know, with an average distance of 70 miles between each one, and there are some, I mean, you look at Utah and, and you know, there's some that pretty close together there uh, and uh, outside of the um, of the big metropolitan areas where they're, they're closely packed as well. And, and it's just, it gives confidence it gives for, for people who haven't made the jump to electric yet, or even maybe they're dry, driving a plug-in hybrid or something. Uh, to see more of them cropping up is, uh, is a confidence uh, game, and that will do more to encourage people to buy EVs than, uh, than many other things, actually. Right. It's like the chicken and egg thing. You have to have the infrastructure to give people the confidence to buy an EV. And, you know, we are just about there. Well, at least in, this, in parts of the country. I can see in the middle up in the north, it's kind of kind of sparse. And it, it's taken Tesla a while. They, they just hit their last uh, their last state. I think it was south of North Dakota. That they put their first charger in recently as well. The and whole it, corridor for North Car North Dakota is now filled in with version three, 250 kilowatt superchargers. Oh, that's nice. We need that. I, I, you just filled up at the uh, the first one on the East Coast, the version three of the supercharger, right? Uh, I haven't gone to that particular unit, but there's plenty of other ones on the East Coast. I think Tom, oh. I mean, Virginia has 10 of them now. Tom, you have a whole bunch in Jersey, but it's the first okay. one on the southern route of I-95. Uh, I see. Okay. So let's move on real quick. We're all over, already over time. Okay. Let's just get, hit a couple of things real quick then. I uh, just wanted to say that, uh, so the a Tesla analyst has uh, stated that the Cybertruck electric pickup has a so pre-orders have exceeded 650,000. I think we were talking about 700,000 last week or something. So this is just kind of confirms, you know, that's there's, there's a lot of people on the list for a cyber truck and that's pretty crazy. It's really popular. So it's so popular that, um, I guess, so inside of ease is owned through motor one and the, eventually the, uh, motorsport.com. And um, they, we have a, a games division, and they are developing, or they're, they're playing around with the idea of developing a, a little game based on the cyber truck. And you can scoot over to Inside EVs, and you can find some video. I think we put it out there yesterday, and you can see some uh, Inside EVs um, labeled cyber trucks. And there's a Motor One cyber truck and a motorsport cyber truck racing through the desert. It looks pretty cool. I think, uh, I think it'd be a lot of fun with 700 and some thousand orders or 650,000 at least orders. I think we could probably get a few downloads. What do y'all you, you think? You play games on your phone, Martin? Yeah. I mean, anything, anything cyber truck is fun. Um, it's just a, a case of, of when, uh, when they'll arrive and, um, and when they'll, when they'll finish building the uh, Terra factory in, in Austin, by the end of the year, maybe uh, Berlin's coming along, so they're they're, they're getting better at building uh, building the building. So uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing them coming off the uh, the production line as as soon as possible. That I I gotta say, I don't know whether it's just me. The styling still, I catch myself every so often looking at it, thinking I cannot imagine owning one um, just because it's so unconventional um, looking. Right. And but I, I guess I was looking. Um, 
uh, quite a few publications uh, went to the Peterson um, over the last week and took some really high def photos of Cybertruck that I'd never seen before. So some real close up uh, shots from the museum where it's on on display, by the way, um, where you can just see the the fold of the metal and the uh, the design of the lights and and they kind of you know really went in with the the close up camera and uh, I'm just staring at the detail for a, for a while looking at those photos and then kind of zooming out again and looking at the thing whole and just thinking it's so unconventional looking I wonder how many of those six fifty or seven hundred thousand people follow through that's not people who have be the question. Who have, who have paid for the car um how many actually follow through with it and how many just want to put a screenshot online to say i bought a cyber truck no you haven't um or just want to you know get in line i wonder how what the conversion rate will be probably pretty high but every so often i catch myself looking at it going, i couldn't i could not imagine driving um one of those but then again british roads are really small so i don't really count do i right in the uk yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not target audience for this thing <laughs> i'm not the target audience Right, but but you bring up a good point. How many people of the six hundred and fifty thousand are going to convert? I'll tell you from my side. Every single person I know, including myself, who put the hundred dollars in to say we've reserved the Cybertruck, is not going to buy one. Right. So, but there was that was the case where there was, there was a lot of people who put down money for the the Model Three and ended up canceling their order as well. But then those those so orders get replaced by new people coming in who who learn about it and you know. Yeah, so, that was, it was only a hundred dollars too. You know, in, in in past Tesla had had a, a, a larger deposit to put down to reserve. You know that it's it's just so easy to plunk a hundred dollars down to Martin's point and say, "Oh yeah, I bought a Cybertruck." You know, and, I could even do that. You know, so yeah, I, I'd imagine a lot of those numbers are going to shed, and also a lot of it because of you know COVID. You know, a lot of people. Uh, That's true. You know, this is this is going to be. This isn't just a little blip on the radar. I, I think we all w hope that it just goes away. But, you know, I think the long impact on this financially is going to be much bigger than what we all want to admit right now. And, um, you know, you know, buying this, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollar, $60,000, you know, space toy, you know, which is, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, it you know, it, 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 it's really cool. I mean, I, I mean, I'll admit, I, I have I'm one of the people that reserved one. And there's a good chance that I'll come through with it and buy it um, because I always have a pickup truck. I, I, I plow my properties. I plow my driveway. And, um, you know, my, 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 my Toyota will be, you know, f six years old when by the time that I can get a cyber truck. And it's I kind of five, six years is when I kind of um, uh, replace the truck. So the timing's perfect for me. And uh, uh, but it's also real. I think a lot of people underestimate how big it is. And, um, you know, Elon had originally said they were going to make it a little bit smaller. Um, this, this, the Cybertruck isn't going to fit in a lot of people's garages. And I think that's going to be a little bit of a deal breaker for a lot of people too, that, you know, I'm spending all this money on this, this gorgeous vehicle. I want to keep it nice. And, uh, right. oh, oh, you know, oh, I can't park it in my, in my garage and maybe their driveway's not big enough. So I think that's another potential reason why we're going to shed mo some of the reservations, but I don't think there's going to be any shortage of buyers. You know, Tesla talks a really great game about, oh, yeah, by the end of the first year of production, we'll be making 200,000 of these, whatever vehicles they are. They never do. They're always it always takes them a long time to ramp up. So I don't think that's going to change. So they're going to sell as many as they can make for the first few years. Uh, and, and but but it, we're, we're not going to see. 650,000 uh, sales, you know, in, in, in anytime soon. Um, but that's okay. I mean, it's, 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 right. it, you know, I'm not knocking Tesla for making it a hundred dollar deposit. I think it is a brilliant marketing move to, to have people say, you know, that we've got 650,000 reservations, but you know, when all said and done, that's going to thin out greatly. I mean, I, I'd probably be surprised if 50% of those reservations actually follow through and buy one. Well, that's a bold statement. Fifty percent. Well, well no, I would say fifty percent's high. I would say oh, really? less than fifty percent will follow through. Yeah, well, I said I'd be surprised if it was fifty percent. So I'm, we're thinking on the same le level, Kyle. Yeah. But it, yeah. it doesn't matter. Like I said, because I think uh, the, uh, the Tesla's going to sell as many as they can make for the first few years. You know, right. there's going to be to every time Tesla makes a new vehicle. Although the Model Y, it seems they've gotten a lot better with. But but pretty much all the vehicles they've made, there's always huge 
problems at the beginning of production where they have to go back and retool. Look at the cyber truck, like how unconventional that is. You, you think they're just going to, you know, start making these things and everything's going to be fine. You know, no. the, you know, that, 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 you know, this, the potential to have the most problems with this vehicle because it's so unconventional, but um, I hope that's not the case. Um, but they're going to, they're going to sell as many as they can make for the first few years. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, it's just, like, yeah, it's such an unconventional vehicle. Making it is, is like different than making any truck from before. And it's hard to imagine them not running into some unforeseen problems with that, but yeah, it's still early days yet. So we'll see how that all pans out. But anyway, that brings us to the end of our show. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post or in the YouTube comment section or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. And don't forget, you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Tom is at Tomalog. Uh, Martin is at EV News Daily. Kyle is at Out of Spec. And I'm Dominic underscore Y. Um, Click subscribe and tap that bell notification for bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all next week. Ciao.